All right, good morning, everybody. It is so exciting to have uh, everybody with us from wherever you may be joining us. Uh, we're really excited about worship today. We're really excited to uh, gather together virtually. We're kind of getting used to that a little bit, I think. Uh, but uh, I encourage you right now, get up off your couch. Uh, get up out of bed if that's where you are just for a minute as, as we get into worship. And I just want you to pretend like you're here. Uh, you're right here with us. Uh, turn up whatever device you're using as loud as you can. And uh, just go ahead and blow the roof off your house, uh, off your bedroom, wherever you might be, out of your kitchen. Uh, and let's just bring the glory of God into uh, this setting. And, and this is an opportunity for us to invite God's presence into places all around the community rather than just where we're all together here in the building. So uh, I invite you to join with us. Uh, sing at the top of your lungs. They've all heard you sing in the shower anyways by this point. So you can't offend the family. Uh, and, and maybe you can get them singing with you. But uh, yeah, go ahead, stand up with me, and uh, we'll open in prayer and just get into some great worship today. Lord, thank you so, so much for your presence in our lives. Thank you for the fact that, that you don't give up on us, that, that uh, viruses and pandemics don't take you by surprise. You've been preparing these things for us to continue to worship you, to continue to grow together, to continue to outreach uh, in spite of whatever the world might want to throw at us. And I thank you for bringing us along on this ride. God, we're going to enjoy the adventure. Uh, we're even going to enjoy the fact that you're with us in the scary parts, and uh, we worship you for that, God. We celebrate you and the life that you bring. In Jesus' name, amen.
celebrate him this morning. You're doing great things in me, God. Oh, I love to watch you work, Lord.
worship him. God, you do great things. God, you are amazing. You are God unshakable. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My soul cries, hallelujah. Blessed be your name, oh God. You are worthy of all blessing and honor and glory. Power and praise. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. How wonderful is your name. You are worthy, Lord. How great you are. Mighty and powerful, Jesus. Before the beginning of time With no point of reference He spoke to the dark Fleshed out the wonder of light And as you speak A hundred billion God is a born in the vapor of your breath the planets warm if the stars were made to worship so high, I can see your heart in everything you make every burning star is saved
You'll surrender, so will I. I will follow you, Lord. I will follow you, Lord. Lay down my life before you, God. You gave so much for me. this a few weeks ago, as we get into these verse of these songs, the, the verses are questions that, that I'd like for you to answer back to me, from your kitchen, from your living room, from your bedroom, from your driveway, wherever you happen to be, or if you're right here with us, I invite you, just sing this answer back, if this is you. getting through we do do you wish that you could see it all made new we do I want to see it made new God as all creation grown coming come quickly Lord Jesus is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst it is is it good that we remind ourselves of this it is
blessing and honor and glory. You are, you are, you are. You are, you are, you God, His Son, not sparing, sent Him to die. I scarce can take it in. Let on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, He bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior. Great thou art, how great thou art. 
Lord, thank you, God. Thank you, God, for coming and meeting us where we are. Thank you for coming as one of us to take the punishment for our sin. You met us where we were in our brokenness, God. You brought healing and life. And, and here today on a much smaller scale, you're still meeting us wherever we are. Thank you so much for your presence, God, that we just can't get away from. We can't find a place where you are not. So we honor you today, God. We worship you today. We bless your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Wherever you happen to be, you may be seated for a moment. I want to thank everybody for coming. I want to thank everybody for joining in with us. Uh, we're, we're making it through this, and uh, we're not going quietly. Uh, we can move forward. Uh, the kingdom of God is built on the revelation that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he is the promised one of God, and uh, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Uh, nothing's going to stop God's church from growing and moving. Uh, so we're doing a lot, and, and uh, we're staying focused. There's a lot going on. Uh, many of you came out to a work day that we had yesterday, uh, which is an indication of the special things God's doing. We've uh, found a buyer for the building, and uh, as of this week, uh, control of the building is, is being turned over to them. Uh, if you were in our forum last week, you heard this outlined a little more. Uh, just a, a side note, uh, if you have one of the keys to the building, it will no longer work. We've got new keys, uh, so we're, we're moving this forward. It's, it's, uh, it's going great guns. If you haven't been here in several weeks, the new buyers have been doing a lot of stuff to, to give a facelift to the building. It's just special. It's awesome. We're excited. And all this means for us getting to go where we're going to go and do ministry where we're going to do it. Uh, and all in, in, in between time, it's going to be special. And I thank you for joining with us. Uh, my back is very, very glad for every single one of you that came yesterday. Uh, if I did not have one of you, I may not be here right now. Uh, so thank you all for that. And uh, next Sunday, next Sunday, the, the other big announcement for the moment 
we're going to do another drive-in service. We're going to do it uh, out here in our parking lot. There were a couple locations up in the mix, so we couldn't really announce it until we knew for sure. But we're going to do it in our parking lot, just like we did for Easter. Uh, that will be next Sunday for Mother's Day. So uh, go grab mom. You started this quarantine thing with five kids in the house. Now there's only three. And if those three want to survive, get your mom out here. Get her out of the house. Get rid of the stir crazy for a moment. We'll have a special day uh, still being safely socially distanced in our parking lot worshiping together. Uh, so start praying for sun now and no rain. And uh, let's, uh, let's tell everybody about it. Let's make this an outreach. We're, we're not the only ones going stir crazy. So um, get on Facebook, tell your friends, uh, tell your neighbors when you see them sitting out on their porch because they got nothing better to do. And uh, let's, let's get people out here next Sunday just to have a special day uh, in worship together. So with that being said, I'm going to turn this over to Ken to pray for the offering. He's on his way up. Uh, if you're at home and you do want to give, you can click on the giving button that's in the top right corner of our website or tap on the menu button, the three lines button. If you're using a mobile device, you can see a giving link there. You can look us up on Google Pay. young rabbi who had been recently uh, appointed to a congregation, and he had a problem. During the service on the Sabbath, half the congregation stood for prayers, and the other half remained seated, and each side shouted at the other side, insisting that theirs was the true tradition. Well, nothing the rabbi said or did could solve this conflict, and so finally, in desperation, he sought out the founder of this synagogue, a 99-year-old uh, man, he, he actually had to go to the nursing home to find him, and he poured out his troubles to the old rabbi, and, and then he said, now please tell me the answer. Was it the tradition for the congregation to stand during prayers? No, said the other guy. Oh, okay, so it, it was the tradition for them to remain seated during the prayers. No, said the rabbi. Well, well, I don't understand. You know, what we have now is complete chaos. Half the people stand and shout, and the other half sit and scream. Said the rabbi, that was the tradition. Have you ever wondered what the world would be like if there was no conflict or fighting, no people mad at each other, no backstabbing, no people trying to get even or trying to get revenge? there'd be nothing to watch on TV. But, uh, you know, I, I read that the last century was actually the bloodiest in all of human history. If you add up the number of people killed in war, genocide, and mass murder in the 20th century, it adds up to about 120 million people, or in other words, about 3,200 people per day for a century. That's a lot of conflict. And then, of course, there's marriage, which is probably the cause of the most conflict in the world. I've heard it said that most marriages start in wedlock and end in deadlock. It's like the story I heard about some newlyweds three weeks after their wedding day. Joanna calls her pastor. She's in hysterics. She says, Pastor, what am I going to do? John and I had our first fight. It was awful. The pastor says, now calm down, Joanna. Every marriage has conflict once in a while. It's natural. I know, I know, says Joanna, but what am I going to do with the body? We're continuing in our series on the book of Philippians called Enjoy the Adventure. And so we've been saying a, a, a statement of faith each week. It'll be on the slide uh, next, uh, if you can bring that up. A, a statement of faith. Here it is. Life is an adventure. I'm following you, God, through the middle of it. And you are providing for me step by step. 
Help me to enjoy the adventure as I walk with you. <coughs> Life is an adventure, but it's an adventure where you know the ending is going to be good. You know, just like in an adventure movie, it's all going to work out good in the end, right? The hero is going to win the day. It's going to be a happy ending. We know that. Why? Because we're not on this adventure alone. We're walking step by step with God. And I can trust in God that he will provide for me everything I need step by step, day by day. And I know that the story ends with me living happily ever after with God in heaven as part of his family. And so I already know the end of the adventure. So all that remains for me is to enjoy the adventure. And so that's what we're talking about in this series. How do you enjoy it? And today we're starting chapter 2 of Philippians. In this section, Paul talks about growing in our relationship from conflict to Christ-likeness. You're not going to enjoy the adventure of life unless you learn to relate to people in healthy ways. And so let's read what he says. This is some of the most challenging scripture in the whole Bible. Philippians 2, starting in verse 1. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality uh, something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And found in appearance of a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. The theme of this section is found in verse 5. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Well, oh. Okay, I mean, in your relationships, just be like Jesus, right? No problem. Well, uh, yeah, actually, that maybe isn't so easy. How do you even do that? How do you become like Jesus Christ in your relationships? Well, Paul gives us some practical steps that we can start applying today. These come directly from verses 3 to 5. And we're going to start with the easiest one, but I warn you, they get harder from here. Paul starts out by telling them, stop the competition. In verse 3, he says, do nothing out of selfish ambition. The Jerusalem Bible translation actually says, there must be no competition among you. Imagine the Bengals are playing this fall. It's their first game with Joe Burrow as the new quarterback, right? And you've got Jonah Williams up on the line blocking for him. It's his job to protect the quarterback. But then Jonah says, you know what? I'm a little ticked off at Joe Burrow. You know, he hasn't been appreciating me. You know, he hasn't been meeting my needs. And, and so instead of blocking for him, the moment the ball is snapped, I'm going to turn around and go tackle him myself. The team obviously could not survive like that, right? But that's what some families are like. We compete with people on our own team. The husband and wife and the kids are on the same team. And, and then we have thoughts like, well, he isn't appreciating me, and, and so I'm going to get him back. Or she doesn't meet my needs, she doesn't respect me, and so, you know, I'm, I'm going to make her pay. You ever been over to a friend's house and you see a husband or wife competing with each other, criticizing each other, cutting each other down? you got to stop the competition. You're on the same team. You can't be tackling your own quarterback. So why do we compete? Verse 3, Paul says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Another word for vain conceit is simply pride. Pride is why we compete with people on our own team. And it ends up everyone. Have you ever been in an argument where you knew you were wrong and you just refused to admit it out of pride? I have, but I won't admit it. One, one marriage counselor said that most couples could save like 200 bucks in marriage counseling by simply realizing the root of their marriage problems is selfishness, me first. 
Paul says, don't do anything from selfish ambition or vain conceit. Stop the competition. Okay, that was the easiest point. The second way that Paul gives us to be more like Christ in our relationship is value others above, <coughs> excuse me, value others above yourselves. In verse 3, Paul says, rather in humility, value others above yourself. Now, when he says above, he's not talking about, you know, superior, like you're better than me or I'm better than you. He says, he's talking about how you treat people. He says, instead of putting people down, you actually treat them better than yourself. And, and this is kind of radical. I mean, treat others better than myself? I mean, who, why in the world would I do that? And this is where Paul's teaching on relationships starts to get really hard. Because valuing others above yourself flies in the face of our culture in America. Our society is full of people who think they're better than anybody else. And we've elevated selfishness to an art form. Can you imagine a best-selling book today titled Looking Out for Other People? Nobody would buy that book, right? But Paul says, do the exact opposite of society. He says, treat others better than yourself. You have to wonder, is Paul like joking here? Doesn't he know what people are like? But all Paul is really doing is telling us how to put in action what Jesus taught us. Paul's command to value others above yourself is simply an application to relationships of Jesus' command to deny ourselves. Jesus is the one who said in Luke 9, 23, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Well, what does that really mean when Jesus says, deny yourself? When I was a freshman in high school, I joined the cross-country team, and I was terrible. I was coming in last in all of the races or near last. I got chin splints, which some of you may have had. It's a very painful condition that happens to runners. And so I'd be limping home after practices. I was about ready to quit. And then all of a sudden, one race, I didn't come in last. I, I came in kind of the middle of the pack. The chin splints had gone away. The conditioning had started to kick in. And all of a sudden, I was doing okay. And then next thing you know, a couple weeks later, I was the fastest freshman on the team. Everybody was wondering what happened to Ken, you know, me especially. I had no clue what had gone on. Suddenly, I'm, I'm running fast. So in the next race against another local high school, I take off at the beginning of the race, and I'm feeling good, and I'm, I'm out front for the first time ever. I'd, I'd never led a race before this point. And then after a few minutes, I realized, I'm not only in front, I, I'm so far in front, there's nobody even close to me. And this was like a completely new experience for me. And then I realized I had a problem. You see, a cross-country race is about three miles, and it's not on a track. You're running through fields and sometimes woods or, or sometimes a golf course. And there's lots of turns along the way. And, and we're at this other high school's course, and so I've never run on this course before. I don't really know it. And the course is marked out by flags that tell you where and when to turn. But I'd never had to pay any attention to those course markers before because I didn't need to. I was always following a whole bunch of other guys. You know, I just followed the guy. I didn't pay attention to the course. But now I started to realize, you know, maybe I should have paid more attention to the rules. Like, how do you know when to turn and which direction to turn? And, and I really wasn't sure. And that's when it happened to me. I turned the wrong direction. And so I'm feeling good. I am running fast. I'm way ahead of everybody else going the wrong direction. Fortunately, my coach saw it somewhat quickly. And, and without a minute, he you know, yelled, Ken, you're going the wrong direction. He got me turned around right. And, uh, but then I had to backtrack. And, and by the time I got back on track, the lead runner from the other team had caught up to me. And I almost lost the race because of that goof. Fortunately, I was able to pull it out at the end and win. But just imagine this. Imagine you're in a race, and the starting gun sounds, and you are running as hard and as fast as you can, and your legs are burning, your chest is heaving, and, and you're sweating, and your face is pouring down your back, and 
And yet you don't even notice because you're in front. You're winning. There's nobody even close to you. You're, you're beating everybody else. You think, this is great. I can't believe I'm winning this race. I'm, uh, this is so cool. And, until you realize that you lost the race because you made a wrong turn. And it's because you didn't understand the rules of the race course that you were on. And so you're going the wrong direction. And the reason our society is like it is, with all of our emphasis on self, is that people do not understand the rules of the race that God has set before us. Jesus told us what those rules are to the race of life. The race that you and I are running right now, whether we realize it or not, the finish line of that race is directly in front of the throne of God where your race and mine will end on the judgment day. The Bible says that you and I will receive our prize at the resurrection of the righteous. And do you want to know what the rules of that race are? Do you want to know the winning strategy which Jesus told us will win the prize? Here it is. The winning strategy is to care about others. And not just ourselves. It's to let others go first. Without having to have our own way. It is to give without expecting to receive in return. It is to be humble like Jesus. The same Jesus who said, deny yourself and take up your cross daily. You know, in those days, a cross was not a pretty piece of jewelry that you would hang on a necklace around your neck. In those days, a cross was an executioner's tool. Nobody took up their cross unless the Romans were going to nail them to it. It'd be like today if somebody said, hey, uh, you know, pick up your electric chair that I'm going to kill you on later today. Or, or, you know, put your head into this hangman's noose. That's about what it would be like. Jesus is saying, if you want to follow me, you have to die to yourself to selfishness and do it daily take up your cross daily he's saying to us that every day you need to find at least one opportunity where you can choose to do the hard thing rather than the thing that comes naturally every day a time where you choose to do the sacrificial thing and not the easy thing a time where you can help others rather than just help yourself That's what it means to take up your cross. And so when Paul applies this to relationships and tells us to value others above ourselves and treat others better than ourselves, what does that look like? Let me give you some examples. When you dedicate yourself to meeting the needs of your spouse, your children, your co-workers, your parents, or, or anybody else around you, without expecting anything in return, That's valuing yourself. When you're grateful for what God has given you, even though it's less than what others have, that's valuing yourself, valuing others. When you share your faith with others at work or school, knowing that you may be insulted or put down, that's valuing others. When you volunteer your time or energy to help and serve others without having to be recognized, appreciated, or rewarded. That's valuing others. When you can rejoice in the success of others around you without envy. That's valuing others. When you can accept criticism willingly and learn from it with a teachable attitude. That's valuing others. When you submit to God-given authority, even though you don't understand or even agree, that's valuing others. When you refuse to become bitter or retaliate when people let you down or treat you unfairly, that's valuing others. When you choose to let God repay wrongs and you're content to wait for your reward in heaven, that's valuing others. When you have the attitude of Christ Jesus, that is valuing others. And this is difficult stuff. But you know what? Paul isn't done. The third way to be more like Christ in our relationships is to look out 
for the interest of others. In verse 4 he says, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of the others. I read an article this week. Let me read you a part of it. Hidden during this pandemic is another virus, one affecting our church communities, countries, and the world. It doesn't raise the body temperature or cause shortness of breath. It doesn't diminish one's ability to taste or smell. It can't be detected by a nasal swab or discovered by taking one's temperature. It can't be cured by therapeutic drugs. A ventilator won't help you survive it. A vaccine won't protect you from it. This virus moves secretly through our personal and community systems, not only in times of crises, but even in the best of times. What is that virus? Self-interest. Not surprisingly, in times of public fear and anxiety, me first becomes our battle cry. Neighbors say it. Political leaders say it. We all say it. Whether it's an adult hoarding toilet paper or a politician denying export of medical equipment, the virus of self-interest affects us all. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, this is so true. And in fact, it is so true that I even know what you're thinking right now. What you are thinking is, what's so bad about self-interest? I mean, i got to think of my own needs, right? Well, what's so bad about self-interest? What's so bad is that self-interest is the priority of this world, but it is not God's priority. In fact, Paul says, you've got to do the opposite. He says, if you want to follow Jesus, then value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. At 3.30 on, June after, on a June afternoon a few years ago, a 21-year-old man with muscular dystrophy named Ben Carpenter drove his electric-powered wheelchair down the sidewalk in the town of Pawpaw, Michigan. As he approached the street crossing at the corner of Red Arrow Highway and Hazen Street, a semi-truck came to a halt at the stoplight. Ben began to cross the street in his wheelchair just a few feet in front of the truck. When the light turned green, somehow the 52-year-old truck driver didn't see Ben in his wheelchair. With Ben still in front of the truck, the engine roared to life and the huge semi pulled forward. When the truck struck Ben's wheelchair, the wheelchair turned, now facing forward, and the handles on the back of the wheelchair became lodged in the grill of the semi-truck. The wheelchair kept rolling, and Ben, wearing a seatbelt, was held in his chair. And the truck driver was completely oblivious to the fact that he had hit the wheelchair. The truck picked up speed, soon reaching a speed of 50 miles an hour. Still, the wheelchair and Ben were pinned to the front. While the driver continued along in his own little world in the truck cab, People along the road saw what was happening. And in fact, everyone seemed to see it except for the truck driver. Frantic observers called 911. People waved their arms and shouted and honked and tried to get his attention. Two off-duty policemen saw what was happening and began to pursue the truck. But on drove the trucker without a clue. On the road behind the truck were two new parallel lines that marked off where the wheelchair's rubber wheels were being worn off truck driver didn't notice a thing. Finally, after two terrifying miles, the driver pulled into a trucking company parking lot, still clueless to the presence of Ben Carpenter pinned to the front of his truck. Miraculously, Ben was unharmed. Now, you ask yourself, how could this truck driver just drive merrily on his way, ignoring the fact that he's pushing another man in a wheelchair? You know what? In a way, you and I do the exact same thing. We roll merrily on our way in life. We are so wrapped up in our own interests, our own needs, our own desires, our own goals. We're driving our Mack truck down the road, getting faster and faster. And all the while, we're surrounded by people who are swept along with us and impacted by everything we do. Our kids, our spouse, our coworkers, our friends, we're, we're impacting so many people. And yet, we're so focused on our own interests, our own needs, our own desires that we don't even notice the impact on the others around us. 
And so in this verse, Paul is kind of saying, stop the truck. Just stop the truck for a minute. You know, just stop thinking about only your own interests, about only your own needs, only your own desires, and put yourself for a minute in the shoes of those around you and start thinking of their interests and their needs, and then do something about it. Do something to help them and look out for their interests. You know, this is one of those areas that it sounds really difficult, but when you actually do it, then you discover there's a blessing involved. I've seen it so many times. People will volunteer to help in one of our ministries, like our food pantry or the Family Promise Homeless Shelter, or maybe they go to Pine Ridge on our mission trip, you know, and maybe they do it the first time just out of obligation. Because they're thinking, you know, I know it's the right thing to do, and I ought to do my part, and, and so, you know, I'm just going to bite the bullet and show up and expecting to be miserable. And then they have fun helping others. And they say, whoa, whoa what is happening here? I, I was supposed to be miserable, but, you know, this is actually kind of fun. What's going on here? What's going on is that God has put inside each one of us a hidden switch that turns on when we help other people who cannot repay us. And when that switch flips on, it produces joy in our lives. But the tricky thing is, it's a hidden switch. And so we never think in advance that helping people will produce joy. It's only after the fact that we realize it. And we realize later that some of our best memories come from those times when we helped others the, 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 those are the things that we remember years later I, I still remember you know one of my most significant memories as a kid is when my mother took us kids down to the housing projects in New York so we could help pass out food I still remember about 30 years ago I, I took a trip to Turkey I was driving through Turkey in a little rented Fiat and and I was going around to see the locations of the seven churches that John talks about in the book of Revelation but one of my best memories from the whole trip was not what these churches looked like, but it's when I was driving through the countryside on my way to Sardis, and, and I saw these two women hitchhiking. They were obviously Muslims with head scarves and shawls, and, and, and one of them had a little baby. And, uh, and though I couldn't talk to them because they didn't speak English, they managed to communicate with me where they needed to go, and I actually went several miles out of my way to take them there. And it wasn't a huge deal, but that was one of the most enjoyable memories from that trip. And I still remember it 30 years later. Kathy and I became foster parents and had kids living with us for about 12 years, along with our own three kids. And we had some really difficult times with those various foster kids. At, at times, they about drove us crazy. But you know what? We don't regret a single moment, and we wouldn't change any of it. Because guess what? I, I don't even remember a single TV show that I watched 20 years ago or any of the you know, computer games I played or, or any of the other stuff I did. But I will always remember the time that we invested in those kids. Those are the investments that bring lasting joy in life. And that's why Paul says, you want to enjoy life? Then stop looking at just your own interests and look out for the interests of others. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. And I know it sounds backwards. I know it sounds crazy. But that's what produces joy in your life. The fourth thing that Paul tells us we need in our relationships is to grow in Christ-likeness. In verse 5, he says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Well, okay, but what is that mindset of Jesus? Well, it tells us in the next three verses. In verse 6 it says, <clears throat> excuse me, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Jesus didn't demand his own rights. He wasn't walking around Jerusalem saying, you know, I'm God, and so you better treat me right, you know, because I have my rights. No. He didn't say that. That wasn't his mindset. What he did say was, I'm God, so let me wash your feet. Let me serve you. Here's the point. The person who yields his rights to God gets God 
as the defender of his life? Are you worried about somebody taking advantage of you? Who do you want defending your rights? Yourself or God? Who do you think could do a better job of it? The person who yields his rights to God gets God as the defender of his rights. Jesus willingly gave up his rights. And then in verse 7 it says, Rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. He had a servant attitude. How can you tell if you have a servant attitude? It's really easy. How do you respond when somebody treats you like a servant? Uh-oh. Jesus had a servant attitude. Paul goes on verse 8. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus was willing to sacrifice for the benefit of others. So Jesus didn't demand his own rights. He had a serving attitude. And on top of all that, he was willing to sacrifice for the benefit of others. The person who yields his rights to God gets God as the defender of his rights. We're going to close in a minute, so I'd like the worship band to come up. Let me say one more thing. It is impossible to live with the mindset of Christ in your own power. It is just impossible to live a lifestyle of total unselfishness in your own power. In my own power, I cannot live totally unselfishly with my wife or my kids or the people I work with. You can't either. If you try, it's, it's like beating your head against the wall. You'll just fail time after time. Paul says, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. But to get the mindset of Jesus, you have to have the spirit of Jesus inside you. Let me tell you, <clears throat> if your home is in conflict right now, if your work is in conflict right now, if your relationships are in conflict, then the place to start is by making peace with God and letting him fill you with his spirit. Because when you make peace with God and, and he puts a spirit in your life, then you have the power to make peace in the rest of your relationships but not until. Let's bow in prayer. And you would, would you say this prayer along with me in your hearts, wherever you are right now? Would you say, Father, I am tired of the conflict in my life. And I want to have a good relationship with my family members, whether it's husband or wife, kids, people I work with, my parents, my relatives. And God, because I want to enjoy the people in my life, I ask you to help me to become less selfish, more focused on the needs of others. Would you help me to be less prideful, and more humble? Would you help me to criticize less and compliment more? Would you help me to be considerate of the needs of others, not ignoring them? And most of all, Lord, I ask you to help me to be like Jesus. I know I can't do that in my own power, but I ask you to put your spirit in me and live through me. And I thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. has been restored forgiveness flows from your veins your kindness shows in all your
Lord, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for a new creation, God, that you make in each and every one of us, God, when we come to you. Make us more like you, Lord. Make us more like you. The old is gone, the new has come. Teach me every day, God, how to live like it. Amen. Amen. Lord, you're worthy. You are worthy. In Jesus' name. You will have a wonderful week. Uh, let Jesus make you more like him every single day. And hopefully next Sunday we'll see you here in our parking lot looking seven days more like Jesus. You have a great day. Now, Lord.